Welcome to the America's Table, hosted by the Georgetown America's Institute. I'm Mooney Jensen, here to sit with leaders from the region who have transformed their vision into reality. Today's guest is Ambassador Roberta Jacobson. Ambassador Roberta Jacobson is a senior advisor at Albright Stonebridge Group, she is my colleague, where she draws on more than 30 years of distinguished diplomatic experience to advise clients on the firm's America's practice. Most recently, Ambassador Jacobson served as Special Assistant to the President and Coordinator for the Southwest Border on the National Security Council. Earlier, she served as U.S. Ambassador to Mexico, where she oversaw the U.S.-Mexico bilateral relationship and managed a very broad array of issues, including trade and investment, security, immigration, the environment, and human rights. Previously, she was Assistant Secretary of State for Western Hemisphere Affairs, Deputy Assistant Secretary of State for Canada, Mexico, and NAFTA, among other diplomatic posts. Roberta was a Fall 2018 Pritzker Fellow at the Institute of Politics at the University of Chicago. She's regularly interviewed on Latin American business and politics in outlets in the U.S. and in the region. Roberta, it is really a pleasure to have you at the America's Table, and thank you for joining us. Thank you, Mooney. So we have seen uh, an array of elections all over Latin America that have um, prompted the analysis that this is a new pink tide, referring to the previous time where Bachelet and um, Argentina, Brazil, so many different countries were veering to the left. Do you think that is happening again? Because other people believe that what there is in Latin America is a, a sort of retreat from democracy. Well, first of all, thanks for having me, Mooney, and it's great to have this conversation at this moment, I think, because there are a huge number of things taking place in the region, elections, changes in policy, and responses to what's going on in the world. Um, to me, the latest elections and potentially ones coming up in the future, I, I'm not sure I see them as a tide, pink, red, blue, whatever. Um, they're so individual to me. Yes, it is true that there are there have recently been elected left of center governments. There's no doubt about that. But they are quite distinct. You have a leader in Chile who's 36 years old and the next generation of, of leaders in the region. And you have a, a president elect in Colombia who is elected after decades of first political activism and um, later um, ruling himself in, in a munici at a municipal level, um, obviously, and so, and is in his 60s, I believe. And so you, you have, I think, really distinct uh, elections, but I also think it's important to understand, I don't see these as a retreat from democracy. These are, in some respects, reaffirmations of democracies in the electoral process. People are voting. Um, people, in some cases, have been quite inspired by these leaders. In other cases, there's no doubt they're voting against something, not in favor of something. But I, what I do see, and I think is just as difficult and, and potentially dangerous, is disappointment. I, I think if there's one word to kind of describe what you see in the hemisphere, in a sense, it's decepcionado. Um, the sense that democracies of the right and the left have not delivered. And so I don't think it's a retreat from democracy, but I think it is a demand for democracy to deliver, and that is a real challenge to leaders. To use the word uh, this consuelo or disappointment, yeah. I have often described them as a need for cambio. It's the, these exactly. are all elections of change. Exactly. And, and in some cases, it's outsiders, simply because they're outsiders, right? A rejection of the status quo. In some cases, it may be somebody who's, you know, Lula running in Brazil, uh, again, um, is not necessarily a rejection of the status quo, since he's been president twice before. But it is a rejection of the government in power, if that's what comes to pass. We have to see how that election plays out. And so there's no doubt in my mind, Castillo in Peru, um, other cases, certainly Lopez Obrador in Mexico ran as an outsider despite being a lifelong politician who had attempted the presidency twice before. So that is very much, I think, um, in operation in the hemisphere. And, and frankly, we can't forget that we saw it ourselves. 
in the United States in, in the election of Donald Trump in 2016. So let's go back to Mexico, where you spend so much time, and you are such an expert in the country. If, if that is ever possible, then you are one of I, them. I'm a student, still it is a, a student. <laughs> a, a highly challenging, challenging country. And, and AMLO was kind of the first of this, of this wave, whatever, whatever it is, the wave of disappointment. Um, what are the main challenges facing Mexico right now? The president is incredibly popular, but there are such tremendous challenges that, that it, are happening every day. It's such an interesting phenomenon. You have a president who began at 80 plus percent approval rating. Having dropped significantly, he's still at 60 plus percent, which of course most leaders in the hemisphere envy deeply. They would, they would love that, that level. Um, and yet the challenges are enormous and frankly, I think growing, not, not receding. Their economic challenges certainly um, Mexico has not had more than about two, one and a half to two percent growth um, in the last decade when it needs four plus to really take off, if you will. Um, obviously, most countries in the hemisphere and Mexico was among them saw contractions during COVID. Mexico saw an eight or nine percent uh, economic contraction. But you also have continuing security challenges that you know, continue to send the homicide rate soaring into new records. You have, um, frankly, an energy policy that looks much more backward looking than forward looking as it is focused almost entirely on fossil fuels, which is not the way most of the world is, is focused. Um, and you have a real challenge right now in terms of the way government and civil society interact. There's been um, a fairly concerted attack on civil society in Mexico in a way that I don't think we have seen, even as civil society has grown over the last two, three decades. So the challenges are enormous. And that doesn't begin to address, I think, probably the two most newsworthy ones, if you will, which are continuing drug trafficking and, and organized crime. Um, now with the real, I think, uh, move into synthetics, fentanyl, and methamphetamines, which unfortunately I think is the future of, of drug cartels. Um, and second, of course, immigration, where Mexico has not just become a transit country, but in fact a receiving country uh, of migrants from all over the hemisphere, and increased numbers from Mexico coming into the United States after a number of years of decline. How could the U.S. engage, uh, there's a lot of Latin Americans that complain that the U.S. has been absent in, in Latin America for a long time. Can the U.S. do more and in what fields can it really engage more? You know, I think if, if, you're, a, if you're a U.S. policymaker the way I was for 30 years and you work on Latin America, your mantra is we should be paying more attention. Right? You, you have spent 30 years trying to tell senior policymakers to pay more attention to this hemisphere, to the Western hemisphere. Um, so I always think that the U.S. should be doing more and paying more attention. Um, I think it's interesting because President Biden has a greater history and engagement with this hemisphere than, than most recent presidents. Um, and I think that, unfortunately, crises around the world have again, uh, diverted his attention from what he would like to do, which is engage more with Latin America. I think you know, what we saw at the Summit of the Americas in Los Angeles was, in a sense, the instinct of Biden, which is he really does want to engage with this region and do more. Um, I'm not sure it was quite as successful as I might have hoped in terms of concrete um, initiatives. But I think there were some really notable areas where we need to now be aggressive in following up, right? One of those is migration, right? The migration declaration that came out of Los Angeles was different for a couple of reasons. One, I think it acknowledged, and this is really important, that this is not a U.S. or a U.S.-Mexico issue. This is a regional issue. Six million Venezuelans have left that country in the last few years. Mm -hmm. Uh, recently, I think the figure put out in Colombia just a couple of days ago was that that population is closer to two and a half million, um, it, not, not under two, which had been cited before. Um, you have populations of Haitians who have lived in Chile or Brazil for the last decade, 
now moving north to try and come either to the U.S. or elsewhere. And so this is a hemisphere, and, and of course I think we should note folks from outside the hemisphere coming through the hemisphere to try and get to the U.S. So one, it was a truly regional approach, I think, which was important. Number two, for the first time in a very long time, the U.S. and its partners spoke in terms of migrants and migration as an economic driver. And, and I think that's really important because there are a number of countries, Canada and the U.S. in particular, but others soon, frankly, who have labor shortages, who need these migrant populations. And therefore, we need to think about migration in a different way, both enabling people to stay in their home countries or in the first country they may go to, but also regularizing and creating many more legal mechanisms for work, not just refugee and asylum status, so that we can, in fact, revitalize our labor forces in aging populations. And while the U.S. has been distracted with, with other problems, both in the U.S. and out, uh, China has made a, a tremendous inroad into, into Latin America, both as a creditor, as a trade partner, um, participating in the largest infrastructure projects around the region, maybe with the exception of Colombia. I don't know for how long um, China is now its main main partner. Is that something that is concerning to the, U to the U.S., or, or is Latin America on the verge of becoming kind of a proxy uh, land or a proxy war between, the, between China and the U.S.? You know, I think, I think there's a couple of things we have to separate out. In the early 2000s, I think you were looking at a Chinese Latin America relationship on the whole South America, but but not exclusively at the beginning, which was commodity driven, mm -hmm. right? It was it was all about China's rapid rapid growth and the need for commodities, whether those were mining, whether it was soy, cattle, other things. And in some respects, I think China initially tried to translate its model from Africa into Latin America, and that model, of course brings not only its own labor when it invests, but also in, at times ignorance or, or willful disregard of environmental regulations and other things. I think it was clear pretty quickly that that model wouldn't work in Latin America. Um, the Chinese adapted to that, and frankly, much of Latin America, especially South America's growth, came from that Chinese appetite for yeah. commodities. So. I, I don't want to say that it was a bad thing for many of the countries of the region. But as it developed, what you saw were other projects, infrastructure projects, and things which, frankly, were not necessarily what countries needed. They were not transparent in their, in their bidding process, if you will, and in their construction. And there's a wariness right now, I think, of China, as well as a welcoming. This, to me, especially if you put that alongside of a slower Chinese ec economy and COVID, and the idea of reshoring, nearshoring, allyshoring, whatever you want to call it, means that I don't know that we should necessarily see China as a threat in the hemisphere to our own engagement, but we better be paying attention, yeah. and we better see the opportunity for our own engagement because otherwise it, it could become that. I think one of the areas that China takes a much longer term view than the United States, um, and I think we have retreated, is what's called, and I, I hate the term, but is called soft power, right? The United States closed its, or stopped funding its binational centers in the 80s, years ago, uh, which taught language and, and helped yeah. fund scholarships and other things. We still have exchange programs with the region. But when China came into the region, launching Confucius centers and no cost uh, exchange programs, we were asleep at the wheel. And we need to move back into that soft power space as well as in you know, commercial and, and other areas. Um, because China is moving in there and has really taken, as I say, a much longer term view, whereas the U.S. kind of, unfortunately, we work in sort of one year budget cycles. Right.
Right. So when I was a student here of Latin American studies a long time ago, it was the NAFTA years. It was a, the time where there was a lot of excitement about a, a free trade area of the Americas and some um, efforts at, at regional integration. And, and I, think, I can't help but think right now with so many cross-country problems, security, immigration, climate change, pandemic, the, the pandemic, et cetera, right. there are so many reasons for these countries to create regional blocks, both trade and, and in, in, other, in other areas, and yet it hasn't happened. We've seen Africa do it, we've seen Southeast Asia do it, mm -hmm. and there really is very little appetite for integration in, in Latin America. Do you see that changing? Yes and no. Yes and no, I would say. I, I think the jury's still out. At least I hope the jury's still out and we haven't closed the door. I do think it's interesting when you look at some initiatives, later initiatives, right, post-free trade, right? There, were, there was NAFTA, the Chile FTA, obviously um, CAFTA DR, Colombia, Peru, et cetera. In some respects, that was the U.S. attempting, post the failure of FTAA largely because of Brazil, um, to, to build the blocks of it to a point where you would sort of de facto have a regional trade agreement. And that hasn't really come about. In the meantime, you have the Alliance of the Pacific. Yeah. And in my view, one of the really big failures of the last couple of years was U.S. pulling out of TPP. Um, TPP, it seemed to me, was in some respects the next natural step for the countries that were interested. And I think you would have seen a lot of other countries want to be part of that, just the way you've seen a remarkable number of countries in the region that want to be part of the Alliance of the Pacific, countries that aren't even Pacific yeah. countries, right? So I think there actually is some willingness to consider integration. Um, I'm not sure that it's traditional free trade agreements. And I think you raise a really important point, which is more and more what we face are transnational issues which need transnational solutions, right? If, if you allow cartels and organized crimes to divide They're very us, transnational. Exactly. Yeah. They are agile. They are transnational. They, they don't, you know, remain within borders. If we fight them only as nation states, we fail. We, we see that over and over again. But the same is true on environmental issues and climate change, on pandemics and global health. Um, and, and frankly, I think, you know, even the notion of rules-based economic and commercial um, arrangements have to be multinational. So I think that we've got to be looking for new ways to create that integration. Um, this Economic Partnership of the Americas that was launched in Los Angeles at the Summit of the Americas, I I'm not sure exactly what it will become, but I think the conception is to begin building pieces of this with transnational components um, it it for integration. Um, at least I hope so, because that's where we have to be going. And not in the political way like Mercosur became or like exactly. the Exactly. The, the, op, the Club de Lima or, right. you know, these, these very fragile. Fragile. And ideological. Sort of, and ideological, and exactly. And I think that what you're, what you're hopefully going to see, and this is why I get back to this idea of sort of pink tide, what I'm hoping to see is in a sense a new generation, whether demographically or not, of leaders who are less ideological and more pragmatic. I, I think you see it already in Boric. He's navigating a very tough path in Chile, but he, he knows he has to be pragmatic. He's got a Congress which is not composed the same way as his constituent assembly is. Um, you know, I just, I think that we aren't post ideological yet, but, but I think we're moving in that direction. But the U.S. has to be there as a partner, has to be there as a partner. Let's talk about the private sector. You flipped over from after 30 years of, um, of working in, in policy to, to helping companies enter different markets. And sometimes and we struggle trying to get American companies into Latin America, especially for large projects, especially for things that, that require innovation. What is the role of 
the U.S. private sector, and then also the, the Latin American private sector to f in filling the gaps of sometimes uh, governments that are, that are underqualified or that are not performing? I, I think it's a really important question, and it's been a really interesting exploration for me because I think that the U.S. private sector, I think you're absolutely right, has not always been present. I mean, frankly, we try. We, we do try, but, but, but one of the problems of confronting what are, in very large measure, state-owned or partially state-owned enterprises in China is they can bid on and get involved in projects which, quite honestly, are economically or commercially unviable um, because they're subsidized by their government. Um, that's true in some other countries as well. And whereas with, our, with the US private sector, if a project doesn't make sense to a company's bottom line, they're not gonna play, or if the risk is too great. Now, I think the government has a role to play there with some of our agencies, which need to be fairly, I think, more aggressive in this region. And that includes the former OPIC, now um, DFC, DFC uh, Development Finance Corporation. It includes Exim Bank, which has been sort of under siege for a number of years. It includes TDA, which does, TDA does, Trade and Development Agency does feasibility studies. When companies may not really be thinking that they could do a project, they do the feasibility study and then the company has a greater sense of, of kind of um, possibility and, and, and lower risk. So I think all of those things are critically important to be working together. Um, but I also think that the private sector in the region and in the U.S. has to pay more attention, and I hope will, to 900 plus million consumers who have a strong preference for U.S. products yeah. if they're given that choice. Um, you know, but we also have to try and mitigate some of the disasters for U.S. companies. When Mexico canceled the expansion of its airport, there were major U.S. companies involved in that construction that was largely complete. And this is the kind of thing that turns U.S. companies off to these markets, even though you and I both know those markets are very differentiated. There's greater risk in some than in others. But, but I think that that, that, that unfortunately, that legacy um, lasts longer than, than we might hope. Let's flip to your career. How did you start working in Latin America? How did you get so engaged in Mexico? And, and I know it's, it's a love affair that continues, but where did it, it start? So it's really interesting because I, I have often said to people, you know, what is a nice Jewish girl from New Jersey doing making her whole career in Latin America? And I think I, I say this somewhat lightly, but it's also true. When I went to college, I was in college as Latin American countries were returning from military rule to civilian rule um, a long time ago. And I was studying political science. I wanted to do international affairs. And Latin America to me seemed like such a laboratory for the democratic experiment. Um, it was so exciting, the things that were happening, whether it was you know, in, in Argentina and, and the terrible human rights abuses, but the, the first real national commission on disappearances globally um, or other places. And so part of it was, was just the excitement of that, that democratic promise. But there were two other parts of it. I initially thought that I might want to study Asia, um, but I actually had taken Spanish um, earlier in my, in my schooling. I was pretty good at it. I had a pretty good ear. And I thought, well, if I, if I, take, if I focus on Latin America, I can you know, continue with my Spanish and, and maybe become fluent. If I start studying Asia and learning Chinese or Japanese right now, I may not know more than how to write my name by the time I graduate from college. Um, then there was one more factor, and I, I confess to this, which is I, I have danced since I was four years mm -hmm. old. My mother put me into ballet because she knew I was going to be tall, and she wanted me to be graceful because she said she walked into furniture. Um, and so I've danced. Uh, including all the way through college and, and full-time my senior year in college when I was just writing my master, my, my undergrad thesis. And the rhythms, the music, the dance in Latin America really appealed to me. 
And so it was a combination in some respects of cultural and political that drew me to the region, a region I still think is the most important to average Americans on a daily basis. And you dance on a regular basis. Well, I dance whenever I can. <laughs> <laughs> One of the great things about living in the region is everybody dances at parties or Everywhere, dinner or parties. Events. Right, everywhere. exactly. That's I love great. that. That's <laughs> great. So this is a, a, a leadership series. What advice would you give to a young student, and especially a young woman who wants to work as a diplomat in Latin America? Don't get discouraged. Um, it can be discouraging, discouraging at times. Um, some foreign ministries are really good at moving women up through their ranks. Colombia has been yeah. a standout, not just in its career people, but you know how many foreign ministers have been female in All Colombia? Them, I mean, it's yes. really ex it's an astonishing record. Um, but I would also say, and this is something I tell both young men and young women, I think women hear it a little better. Um, do the job that you're given to the best of your ability. That, those initial jobs won't necessarily challenge every fiber of your being. They won't be the most stimulating. Um, but I have seen too many young people constantly trying to do their next job or look for their next job. Instead of paying attention to being the absolute best, you know, kick ass in their current job, which is not to say that you shouldn't be ambitious. But in a sense, you want to become the go-to person. Um, you want to be the reliable volunteer when something needs to get done. And I think that's critically important. Um, it, 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 it doesn't mean that you shouldn't balance work and, and, and life and, and you know, your career and your family. Um, I have done that on, on occasion, um, becoming one of the first people in the Bureau of Western Hemispheres to do what was, called a, what was then called a compressed work schedule. I, I took every other Friday off. Um, I did that all the way up through being a Deputy Assistant Secretary, and I had so many people say to me, how did you do that? How were you able to do that? Nobody does that. And I said, well, there's a combination of things. I had good bosses. That is true, because the State Department didn't have good regs. Mm. But I asked. Right. Right? There's a lot of culture around don't be that person who asks, um, can I do this? And yeah, I worked really hard those other nine days out of ten. But that gave me a little bit of extra time to be with my kids. Um, I also, you know, I got lucky in having a husband who did all the cooking. Um, and I, I joked at my first swearing in that I thanked my two children, two boys, who knew that every time you had to sign up for something at school, they signed up for plastic cutlery, right? <laughs> they brought the plastic cutlery because no mom wasn't going to be able to make cookies on one night's notice. So you, you do have to balance it. But I think tenacity is, is part of it. Um, you you, you got to just keep, keep at it, demonstrating that you are reliable and smart and willing and, and the good stuff and finding mentors. Finding mentors. That was my next question. Oh my gosh. Is, what are some of the finding inspiring mentors. leaders? I mean, yes. We have Secretary Albright as, as the first in Well, line, I was going to say, I think that's number one on my list here. Yeah. Um, MKA, Madeline Horbell Albright. She, she really... I mean, she wasn't a mentor to me till later in my career because I was so junior when she was at state, but, but an extraordinary leader, leader of women, um, and, uh, and I feel so privileged to have known her um, in, in my working life and later in her life. But I had both women and, and men mentors my whole career. Um, some are, are better known than, than others. I mean, Ann Patterson, a five-time ambassador at the State Department career ambassador who was one of my early bosses, was extraordinary, extraordinary. Um, a tiny little woman from Arkansas who always was super polite and wore Chanel suits, and I can't tell you how many men underestimated her. And I watched that and thought, she's brilliant. She's, she's just brilliant, and she was so helpful. Uh, Donna Reinach, also a four- or five-time ambassador in the in in the Western Hemisphere. Um, but, but I also think that I was able to see in operation um, people outside the diplomatic sphere 
who inspired me. I, I got to Mexico, and soon after I got there, I met a woman named Marcelina Bautista, who was from Oaxaca and was organizing domestic workers in Mexico for the first time, who had left Oaxaca at 13 with a family that, that brought her to the capital as a, as a household worker. I mean, extraordinary, just an extraordinary woman. Um, you know, so I, I think that I've been very lucky. Early in my career, um, I was doing my, mas my master's thesis in Argentina, and I watched Luis Moreno Acampo as the junior prosecutor uh, in the juicio, in the trial of the, of the junta, yes. before he became the very famous prosecutor at the ICC. Um, and got to know him after that when he was founding Poder Ciudadano and, and, and working towards what would eventually be his career at the ICC. These are people who really were very inspiring to me. Um, some of the dissidents I met in Cuba over the years. Um, again, people who didn't always have the biggest spotlight on them. Um, people who were working at the grassroots level, like Jose Daniel Ferrer in, in Santiago de Cuba. Um, I, I just felt, you know, so lucky to meet inspiring leaders, um, but also to have mentors who took the time to educate me, who demonstrated by example, um, and who listened. Who listened. Jeff Davidow, um, former Assistant Secretary for uh, Western Hemisphere and former ambassador to Mexico. So um, I, I just was very lucky in, in the mentors I had. But I will also say for the young women, um, I had experiences that were somewhat uh, difficult as well. Early in my career, it was basically not being taken seriously because I was young, mm -hmm. right? We, we've, we, many of us have felt that. But I also had, had a boss who said to me at one point when I was, you know, hugely pregnant, well, I hope you're not going to get too wrapped up in this motherhood thing because we need you back here, which was a really inappropriate thing to say, <laughs> actually. <laughs> um, and I was really, un really upset. And it was Ann Patterson who, who helped me sort of work through that, told me what to do, how to make sure I protected myself and my career. Um, even while I was starting a family. Um, so, so I think that, that women face challenges in the workplace that others don't. Young women do as, especially. Um, but, but there are so many great examples of, of people who've done extraordinary things. Um, and I'm sure that many of the students who come from, from this place, yes. having, had, having had leaders and teachers from Madeleine Albright to yourself to Alejandro Werner and others, We'll, we'll do the same. Thank you so much for sitting at the America's Table. It's been a pleasure. Thank you, Mooney.